Well, I invite you to turn your Bibles with me. We are resuming our study in the book of Romans chapter 12, a series that I have entitled, Not Serve Us, But Service. God's desire for His people is not that we should have the attitude of, of serve us, but one of service and looking for others. And as we have been studying in Romans 12, we have seen just as fish swim and birds fly, Christians should serve. It should be a part of our makeup and our identity that as Christians we serve. As Jesus Himself said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And if this was His attitude and this was His posture, should it not also be ours as well? Romans chapter 12 has been challenging us with this thought, not serve us, but one of service. It has been said that a man has the freedom to choose his wife. But one of the drawbacks to that is he doesn't get the freedom to choose his in-laws. Apparently some of you know what I'm talking about when I say that. You can choose your wife, but you can't choose your in-laws. It's sort of a gamble of what you're going to ultimately get. Well, I have to say, and, and, and at the risk of embarrassing them, that I have been blessed with the best in-laws that money can buy, or that God can. <laughs> that God can possibly give someone. That is especially true of my father-in-law. Certainly my mother-in-law as well, but my father-in-law didn't have sons growing in their family, and so us son-in-laws quickly became sons. And we have a close relationship, a, a, a great friendship, work together well. But you know, that didn't happen overnight. It actually started, I remember, before we were married, before we were even engaged. We were just dating at the time. And I came in one day and made a comment about taking my car to the Jiffy Loop to get my oil change. And my father-in-law, or at the time, Rebecca's dad, Sam, he, he kind of laughed and says, you don't change your own oil? And I said, I didn't know you could change your own oil. <laughs> and he said, well, bring your car by Saturday. He said, I will show you how to do it, and we'll get out there in the driveway, and, and we'll change your oil. And that Saturday, we got together, and he, we changed the oil in my car. Time went by, and he showed me also how to change a fuel filter, how to change a battery, how to change an alternator, how to change a starter. I drove a clunker of a car for a while, you can tell. But we spent many, many Saturdays in that driveway, laying down in that gravel, talking, getting dirty, loaning each other tools, and, and doing all these different things together. We've grown even beyond that. We do lots of things together, even as father and son-in-law. We play football occasionally. We eat together. We go to the movies. We shop. There's a number of things that as family we do. We do them not only for each other, but we do them with each other. It's in doing this that our relationship is built, that our relationship is strengthened, and that we're able to know each other so well. It would be kind of ridiculous if on the day that, say, we got married, that my father-in-law came along and said, well, welcome to the family, son. Now here's a list of the three things that we'll do together. Imagine if that's all he gave me. Here's three things that we'll do every year, and don't expect anything more than that. It would really limit our friendship. It would greatly limit our relationship. But no, we do a variety of things with each other and for each other, and that has strengthened our relationship over time. My friends, what is true in our physical family should also be true in our spiritual family. We are reminded today in our passage that we should be ready to serve those in, our, in the family of God. We should be ready to serve those within the church without hesitation and without limitation without hesitation and without limitation. God has called us to shoulder each other's burdens and to serve each other in a way that is even closer than what our physical families might even be from time to time. I say that we should do a variety of things for and with each other as the family of God. I say that intentionally because you remember when you were a little kid and you would come to Sunday school and the teacher would have a little chart with your name. And there was two or three little things you were expected to do. If you attended, you had a little sticker on the chart. And if you brought your Bible, you get a little sticker on the chart. 
And if you, you brought some offering, you get a little sticker on the chart. And you get three little stickers there for doing those three things. I fear that some of us haven't grown up beyond childhood. That we measure our Christian life by, well, I attend, I bring my Bible, I give a little offering, and so that's, that's I've done my job. But what you're going to see this morning in Romans chapter 12 that God desires for us to do so much more for each other and with each other as a family of God that is close-knit in all things. I think it's important for us to consider today, don't ask the question, is everybody else doing their part? Until you have first asked the question, am I doing my part? Don't worry about what other people are doing until you have worried about yourself. And Paul is going to challenge the Romans in this passage, and likewise God is challenging each and every one of us today with a reminder that we should be ready to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ without limitation and without hesitation. Ready at a moment's notice. Ready when an occasion arises ready to pitch in, ready to shoulder the burden, ready to do what God has asked us to do. And so this morning as we listen to the message, I don't want you to think about your neighbor, or the person in front of you, the person behind you. I want you to think about yourself. Ask yourself, am I doing my part as God's Word says that I should? Look with me in Romans chapter 12, and I want us to read together verses 9 through 13 for our passage this morning. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. The Word of God says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Now, if you've been with us over these few weeks as we have began looking in Romans chapter 12, we have seen in this series that, first of all, we, should be, we are expected to serve. Based on the mercies of God, as, as he says in Romans 12.1, because of the mercies of God... We should present our bodies, that is our body and our mind and our will, align all of them with God, and that that is our reasonable, our expected response to God's mercies. He expects us in return for His goodness, in return for what He has done, what we give our lives in worship to Him, and that we dedicate ourselves to serve. He says that we're expected to serve. But not only that, he goes on in verses 3 through 8 and tells us that we're gifted to serve. God doesn't just expect us, He gifts us. Each of us, Paul uses the analogy of the body, that just as you have fingers and toes and ears and kneecaps and all different body parts that serve different functions, similarly in the body of Christ, each of us has a role, a place that we can serve and a place that we can fit our role for His glory. So he says we're expected to serve. Then he tells us we are gifted to serve. And now at the end of this chapter, for the remainder of chapter 12, he's going to tell us how do we serve? What do we do? What does this look like practically in my day-to-day life? The nuts and bolts, what does it mean to really have an attitude of service? And in the last half of this chapter, he's going to divide it into two categories. He's going to talk about, first of all, we need to serve those within the family of God. And then we need to be ready to serve those outside of the family of God. That serving doesn't just stop within the walls of this church. It starts here. It begins here. We're going to see this morning. But it goes beyond that. God desires that we serve all those that are around us. Now, the verses that we have before us this morning in verses 9 through 13, these five verses here, I affectionately refer to these as an expositor's nightmare. This passage is a very difficult passage to preach. First of all, because usually when I preach five verses, especially in an epistle, you might have one or two sentences that you're dealing with, maybe three, but it's just a handful of sentences. Well, in the Greek here, you actually have 13 different sentences. Paul's like a little machine gun here. Pop, 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 pop. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And he gives this quick listing of commands. 
And so you're, you're left with, do I preach a 13-point sermon or, or a 13-week series, or what do you do with this? And Paul gives us these very quick little sentences to have to digest in one setting. But the other reason I have to call this a, a difficult passage to preach is not because this passage is, is extremely complex to, and difficult to understand. It's a hard passage to preach because it's so simple. It's so easy to understand. We're not looking for hidden Greek nuances in what he says today. This passage that stands before us, the question is not, do I understand it? The question is, will I obey it? Will I live it? A child could pick this up and read it and understand where it says, pray for each other, give to each other, love each other. I mean, it's very simple. It's very easy to understand. It's quite a different thing to actually go out and live and do. And so in that sense, it is a difficult passage for us to give an attention to. And in these verses, in verses 9 to 13, he gives us this list here, if you will, these 13 little sentences, these little quick things that he tells us. Now, I don't want you to think of these as, a, as some sort of legalistic list. But I want you to look at these things and consider them more like you would an inventory. If you've ever worked in a business or, or restaurant or something like that, that you occasionally have to take inventory. You, you, you take there a sheet of paper that has your, your standard and has your, your, your quotas on it, and then you go through the store and you say, well, we've got plenty of that, and we've got plenty of that, and well, we really could use some more of that. And you go through and you take inventory. And you use this guide to, to, to measure your stock, to see what you have on the shelves. And similarly, what Paul has given us here, this list, if you will, it is for us to look at and take inventory of our lives. Say, do I have plenty of that? Do I have plenty of that? Or maybe I'm lacking in that. Maybe I need a little bit more of that. And Paul is giving us some guidelines here to measure our attitude and to measure the very practice of our life. As we look at this, I hope we will take note and adjust our lives accordingly that our inventory would match God's inventory. That what we have on the shelves of our Christian life would be true of what God says that we should have as well. We should be ready to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ without hesitation and without limitation. What does that look like? Look with me in the passage. We first of all see that we can serve our church family, number one, when we love one another genuinely. We are to love one another genuinely. Notice the beginning of verse 9 there. It's a very simple. It's the first sentence there. He simply says, let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. Now, we will often talk in church and, and in Christian groups, we'll often talk of doing Christian service. Our Word of Life little kids, they learn every quarter or so, every few weeks, they have to do a Christian service. Many students at Liberty, you have to each semester do a Christian service. Have you ever thought about what is the difference between Christian service and just service? I mean, what is the difference between being a nice guy and being Christ-like? I think the difference between just service and Christian service is love. There, there, there's something deeper beneath the surface. There is an attitude and a perspective that, that, is, that, is, that is so basic in our understanding of who Christ is and what the Gospel is. And he says there, and he begins this list by saying, let your love be without hypocrisy. Now this is the first little sentence here, and it's interesting because you can't do this in English, but in Greek you can. There's no verb here. There's no verb in this sentence. All it says is unhypocritical love. That's literally what Paul said. Unhypocritical love. And I think it kind of stands apart from the rest of this because it serves almost as a heading to this entire section. Everything that he's about to tell us, to take inventory of your life, to take stock of your walk with God, the heading to it, the, 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 the title of it, the very top of your list should be that you have genuine or sincere love. That is the starting point. That is the beginning point. Make sure that your heart is one with genuine love for others. He says here, let your love be without hypocrisy. Now, love really is the best word here to understand, but I prefer the more archaic term charity. I like the term charity because 
Today in the 21st century, we don't know what love is. We, we define it and confuse it with emotions and sex and romance and so many other things that are elements or components. But when it comes to what real, genuine love is, I think it's good to think of it in terms of charity, which has the idea of selflessness, the idea of giving, the idea of looking out for the interests of others. That's what biblical love is. It is charity towards those that are around us. And Paul puts it at the top of the list here. And as he will later say in the book of 1 Corinthians, you may have the tongue of an angel, you may be able to sing, you may be able to preach, but if you do it without love, you're just annoying, is what he says. Love, he says, is more important than any spiritual gift. It is essential to our life, to our walk, and to the way that we serve. It is important that we have love. And not just love as we define it, but love as God defined it. What kind of love does he say here? He says, let your love be without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. You've heard before, I'm sure, the, 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 the Greco-Roman thought in that world in that day and time, in the theater, there were actors that would play more than one role. And occasionally, because of that, they'd have to wear a mask. So on one hand, they'd come out and play their role. On the other hand, they'd come out wearing this mask. And that actor was known as the hypocrite who wore the mask. He hid behind that mask, disguised who he really was. And Paul says here, make sure that your love is not like this. That when you come to church and with your family, you smile, you look good, you shake hands, you sing along, but it's fake. It's phony. Paul says, that not your love. Don't let it be hypocritical or fake. Have genuine love. Sincere love. Love that is real, that is tested, that proves itself time and time and time again. This idea of being unhypocritical in our love. You know, I think one of the most telling things about the, the, the story of Judas Iscariot I think one of the most shocking things about that story is that they come to the, to, the, to, the, to the Passover and the Last Supper there, and they sit and eat, and Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And because we know the whole story, you expect them to all turn and look at Judas, you know. But they don't. And I think that was the point of it. He blended in so well, nobody suspected. Nobody even thought of Judas. Judas talked the talk and walked the walk and looked like everybody else. And none of them were the least bit suspicious. But he was a hypocrite. As time went on, of course, you know, in the most telling moment of what we call hypocritical love, he comes to Jesus in the garden with the soldiers that have come to arrest Jesus. And what does he do? He kisses him. And that sign of friendship was actually the sign of betrayal. That's hypocritical love. He kisses him. Hell, Rabbi, he says. It doesn't really mean it. His love was fake. It was not true. And Paul challenges us with this thought. Is your love genuine? Is your love sincere? Is it just a show that you put on to go to church? Just put on your tie and put on your dress and you look nice? Or is it real? Is it genuine? Is it in the fabric of who you are? If you say, well, how do I know that? How can I judge my love? How can I see if that is the case? Well, I think one of the greatest things to do is hold up yourself an x-ray of your life with 1 Corinthians 13. He tells us what real love looks like. Love is patient. Are you patient with those around you in church? Love is kind. Love is not jealous. You get upset when other people get the credit for something that you did. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love doesn't keep a tally book of things. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but love rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Is that the kind of love you have for your brothers and sisters in Christ? A genuine, sincere, unhypocritical love. 
There was a gentleman that I knew some years ago, married into a family, and he had been married once before and, and had a daughter from that marriage and yet got married into this family. And uh, he was just one of the nicest, most outgoing guys that you'd ever know. And just give you the shirt off his back, it seemed like, and, and just seemed so, 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 such a nice guy. And time went on, and, and, and this new marriage, he started to have some difficulties and some problems. And, and, and as the, the ball of wax began to unravel, it turned out that he had not only been married once, he had been married four times. And not only that, but he was seeing another woman while he was married. And not only that, but he had separate bank accounts. He had separate cell phones. He had a separate P.O. box. He had a completely separate identity that his wife knew nothing about. Now, he may have said with his lips, I love you, but his life showed something different, didn't he? He may have said with his lips, I'm committed to you, I'm devoted to you, I have, you, you, what I, you have what I have and I have what you have. We're in this thing together. And his life showed something vastly different. My friends, we may say with our lips, we love the family of God, but is it true and evident in our actions? Is your love without hypocrisy? 1 Peter 1.22 says that we should fervently love one another from the heart. Can you look around this room and look at the people around you and say, I love these people. I mean, genuinely. It may be, well, I don't know anybody. Maybe that's the place to start. Maybe that's the place to begin. In order to love, you have to be vulnerable at some point, don't you? You have to take a risk to walk across the room and introduce yourself. To put out a hand and shake. You have to take a risk to do those things to build that friendship, to build that love. Well, you may say, well, I don't fight with anybody in the church. That's not love. Just not fighting. Well, Paul says, let your love be true. Let your love be genuine. Let it be without hypocrisy. He says, love each other genuinely. Secondly, the way that we serve our brothers and sisters in Christ is that we should discriminate between good and evil intentionally. We should discriminate between good and evil intentionally. At the end of that verse, in verse 9, he goes on to say, Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Now, did you catch the irony there in that verse? What does he say there? What a Christian should be known for are things that they love and things that they hate. You should love certain things but you should also hate certain things. He says here, be, let your love be without, without hypocrisy, but abhor or hate what is evil and cling to what is good. The word there, abhor, means to detest something, to, to be repulsed by something, literally to, to hate that which is evil, that which is sinful, that which is wrong. The, 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 the person whose heart is right before God doesn't dabble into sin, doesn't get comfortable with sin, but as a person who abhors that which is evil. I heard a quote one time that said, the only security against sin is to be shocked by it. The only security against sin is to be shocked by it. You know, I remember a compliment of my in-laws, a compliment of my parents. I remember years ago after coming to college, and of course you get independent and kind of sprout your own wings and begin to do things your own way. And I remember on a couple of occasions... After being out of the house two or three years, I came home and um, with my parents, and I'd say, "Boy, I just saw this movie recently that you guys should watch." And so we'd sit down, and, and my mom and dad, and we'd sit down, and we'd we'd watch a movie, and I'd say, I, "You know," and so we'd watch the whole movie, and I'd be so anxious. What do they think about this? You know, because it moved me to tears, or you know, whatever it might be. And I said, "We gotta watch this." And so we'd watch the movie, and we'd get done, and I'd look at my mom and say, "What did you think?" And she'd say, "Well, that was a good movie, except for those twenty-seven cuss words in." It. And I'd say, you counted every single cuss word in the movie? And she'd say, yeah. And that used to bug me for a while. I'd say, why is she so nitpicky about that? But I come to realize that my mom was abhorring what was evil. Counting cuss words in the movie won't make you holy, but being sensitive to sin will. Abhor with that which is evil. Detest that which is evil. Be repulsed by that which is evil. And cling to that which is good. That word cling is the word used. A man shall leave his father and mother and shall cling unto his wife, shall cleave unto his wife. There is an inseparable link there, he said. 
And the life of the Christian, our lives should be one that we are inseparably linked towards that which is good and towards that which is right. He says here, this is how we should serve each other in the body. Now that may seem unusual. What does it have to do with the body at large to say that I'm discriminating between good and evil in my own life? Well, it's very important because the way the church is designed, the way the church is made up, each of us, if you will, is a gateway into the church. And if in your understanding, your understanding of God's Word, you begin to get into that which is error, or in your life you begin to become comfortable with sin, and you begin to bring that into the church, it may spread, like Paul said, yeast does in a lump of bread. And, and he says here that, that it is protecting the purity of the body, the fidelity and the commitment of the body when each of us discriminate between good and evil in our own lives. And that we hold each other accountable. That we encourage each other in this world. That's the whole point of church discipline. It's not because a church needs to be nosy. It's because we want to be holy. We want to honor God, to abhor that which is evil, and to cling to that which is good. If you've ever played with little magnets before in school or at home, you'll know that those magnets, they have two polarities different on each side. And if you take two magnets that are opposite, they will, they will push away from each other, whichever is the same. I don't remember one. But they will push away from each other. And if you flip them around, what do they do? They snap together, don't they? On the one hand, they, you, you can't make them stay. They just, they just repel each other. But when you flip them in the right direction, they snap together and they cling together tight. That's what Paul says our, our, our perspective should be. That's what God says. When it comes to that which is evil and sinful, we should be repulsed by it, to be repelled by it, to push it away. And yet when we see that which is good, that which is right, we should cling to it with all of our might. You know, sometimes I think we make the mistake of thinking that spiritual maturity that the way we know if we're a spiritually mature person is because we have a degree of education, we have a degree of knowledge. That's actually not the case. Hebrews 5.14, he writes that solid food is for the mature, the mature man, the mature woman in Christ. So what does a mature person look like? He says, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Did you catch that? Being a mature man or being a mature woman in Christ is not just knowing there is good and evil out there. It is choosing good over evil. It's doing that which is right. It's not just being aware of all the options. It's choosing the right one. He says, or abhor that which is evil and cling to that which is good. He says, or you serve your church family. You benefit the body at large when you discriminate between good and evil intentionally. And then thirdly and lastly, I want to stay on this one for a moment. And that is, thirdly, he says that we should devote yourself to the body unquestionably. Devote yourself to the body unquestionably. In verses 10 through 13, he finishes this list giving us this idea. He gives us these ten little mini sentences here. And the overarching theme to these last few verses, these last sentences here, is see to it that you're serving without hesitation, without limitation, that there's no question where you stand in terms of your attitude of service towards the body of Christ. He says in those verses, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. You know, when I read that section there, there's one giant thing that stands out to me. If you don't catch anything else, I want you to catch this. There's one giant thing that stands out to me reading those verses and, and catching the, the tone of what Paul is saying here, and that is this. The life of the Christian, the life of the believer, should be more about what you do and not about what you don't do. Did you catch that? Too long the, the church and Christians have sought to distinguish ourselves based on the things we don't do. We don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this, so we're Christian. But notice what he says here. He gives a whole list of things that we should be known for. Things that we should be doing. If we have a reputation, it shouldn't be about what we're not doing, it should be about what we are doing. 
There are those that measure their Christian life. Maybe even some here this morning that you think, well, I don't drink, cuss, or chew, or go with girls that do, so I must be fine. Listen, my cat doesn't do any of those things, and he's not spiritual. He is carnal, trust me, in every sense of the word. It's not about what we don't do. You know, think of it in terms, if, if over here is sin, and over here is holiness and righteousness and goodness, when we come to Christ, it's not just about saying, well, I don't do this, and I don't do this, and I don't do this, and I don't do this. He doesn't want us to stand right here in the middle and point about what we don't do. He wants us to be found over here in holiness and in goodness and in righteousness. God did not save us for spiritual neutrality. He saved us for spiritual vitality. He saved us to be on this side and not shouting about what we don't do, but showing the world what we do. Showing the world a difference. And Paul gives this list of things. He says, be sure these things are in your life. Be sure the way that you live that these things are evident. What does he say? Look at them briefly. I can't cover all of them. He says, first of all, be devoted to one another, verse 10. Be devoted to one another. There's a funny play on words there that he uses. Uh, he, he says there, literally, show family love in your brotherly love. Show family love in your brotherly love. Towards your brothers and sisters in Christ, show a love that is even deeper, that is more like a family love in what you do. He says, give preference to one another. Philippians 2 says that we shouldn't do anything out of selfishness and conceit, but thinking others as more highly than we ought to think, think of others um, more highly than we think of ourselves. In verse 11, notice this next one. He says, not lagging behind in diligence. Is that true of your life? Not lagging behind in diligence. That is a refined biblical way of saying don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. If you are committed to singing in the choir or committed to something, do it. As a Sunday school teacher, you should be the first person there in class being diligent. There's nothing more embarrassing than me walking a family to a class at 940 and the teacher's not even there. He says here, be diligent. He says here, don't be lazy in your service. I said a few weeks ago, what we lack is not skill, but so often what we lack is sweat. He says to be diligent in your service. Then he goes on to say that we should be fervent in spirit. That word there for fervent, it's literally the word for like boiling water. He says here, you should be boiling in, 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 in your enthusiasm, if you will. You know, Don't come to church looking like your dog just died. Okay, Put a smile on your face. He says, have enthusiasm about the things of God. Have enthusiasm about the family of God. Have enthusiasm about your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't walk in a zombie and leave a zombie. It should be like going to family reunion every week. Full of enthusiasm, he says. He goes on to say not only that, but we should serve the Lord. Verse 12, rejoice in hope. Then he says, persevering in tribulation. I think that one's important. Persevering in tribulation. Again, doing it together. You know, Don't weather the storms of life by yourself. You have a family here, a church family, who is here to shoulder each other's burdens. You know, One shingle by itself will get blown all over the place in a storm, but you take hundreds of them and nail them together, it'll stay put. And he says here, persevere in your tribulations together. Weather the storms of life together. Persevere in those tribulations. Then he goes on to say, be devoted to to prayer. It means to continue in prayer, to linger in prayer for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, don't just say, well, I don't gossip about people in church. It's not about what you don't do. Are you praying for people in church? Are you lifting them up to the Lord? I know everybody has schedules and things that makes life difficult, and I, I certainly try not to be heavy-handed from the pulpit about this. But listen, if you have to choose a service to miss each week, don't miss prayer meeting. It is so essential to the life of the church. He says, be devoted in prayer, continuing in prayer, lingering in your prayers for one another. He goes on to say, then contributing to the needs of the saints. I think we as a church do that quite well. I think we deserve a big compliment on this one. Whether it's St. John's Baptist Church or, 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 or family members in our church that are going through difficulties, I think this is one we do well. 
contributing to the needs of the saints, helping out when people are in need. And then he closes the end of verse 13. He says, another mark should be that you practice hospitality. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time you opened your home up to somebody else in the church? When was the last time you invited one of the new members of the church over and said, I just want to get to know you, meet your kids, find out your story? Well, you know, I, 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 don't, I just don't have a nice home to entertain guests. Well, I'm sorry, is that what he said in the passage? Be hospitable if you have a nice home? No. Some of the most gracious people I've ever met have lived in 700 square foot apartments, and some of the stingiest people I've ever met have lived in 7,000 square foot mansions. He says, practice hospitality. Open your home, open your hearts, open your arms, open your lives to those that are around you. And he says, in doing that, you will grow together and build together as a church. My father one time was preaching at a church that he was candidating at, not the church he's at, but a previous church. And he preached that morning and a gentleman came out to him at the end and he said, well, preacher, he said, I appreciate your message. He said, I want to tell you one thing. He said, if you become the pastor here, he said, you feel free to ask us for money. You feel free to, to, to take up special offerings. But he said, preacher, don't ask us to serve. Folks, that is a wrong and sinful attitude to have. That is the equivalent of saying, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to be like Christ. You can't have it both ways. He says here that our lives should be such that we are ready to serve the family of God without hesitation and without limitation. In a moment's notice, whether it's prayer, whether it's opening our homes, whether it's lifting up others, encourage them in tribulations, whether it's counseling them, whether it's talking to them, whatever it might be, we should be ready to serve the family of God. If everyone adopted this attitude, this posture in our lives, we wouldn't have to have ministry service fairs. We'd have to turn people away. I'd like to serve in the nursery. Sorry, we have too many people serving in the nursery. I like to sing in the choir. Well, there's no, there's no more seats left. Sorry. We'll put you on the list. Wouldn't that be a great problem to have? He says here, be ready to serve. Without hesitation, without limitation, be ready to benefit the body. You know, there's a lot of stories and, and fables, I'm sure, surrounding the death of great men. Particularly, I was reading about the death of George Washington this week. And one of the things that they noticed and noted their historians and scientists that he died eventually of, of blood loss. It was thought in those day and time that the illness could be extracted from the body by bloodletting. And one common practice was actually attaching leeches to the body that would draw out the blood and hopefully rid the body of whatever disease it might have. And scientists say that, that, that Washington lost five pints, I think it was, of blood, which eventually caused himself to die. You know, I thought about that this week and I thought, you know, that's pretty much all a leech is good for. It takes and it takes and it takes and it takes, but it never really gives back. My friend, don't be a leech on the body of Christ. He says to be willing and ready to serve, to contribute, to love genuinely, to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ. And to do your part, putting your hands to the plow for God's glory and the benefit of your family. Johnny Hunt says it so well, you are never more like Christ than when you give. You are never more like Christ than when you give. And that's not just financial giving. That is saying like Isaiah, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And so my friends, the challenge this morning, really the invitation this morning is not come to this altar. Let's go find a place to serve if you don't have one. Go find an area where you can use your gifts, your talents, your abilities to give back to the family of God. Don't just take and take and take, but be ready to give as God has equipped you, as God so desires. Don't say, well, my wife teaches a class, my Kids do this. You're not going to stand in judgment. God's going to say, well, I'm glad of all the things your family did. Good job. Oh, you will give an account for what you have done. 
with what God has given you? Will you honor Him with it this morning? Will you say, yes, I am ready. Without hesitation, without limitation, I am ready to serve the body of Christ as God so desires. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank You for this, Your Word today. Lord, it is challenging. And sometimes, Lord, it it steps on our toes and sometimes, Lord, it pierces us deep to the heart. And Father, we ask and we pray this morning that You might take Your message, Your Word, and press it deep upon our hearts and our lives. Father, we pray that we might not be known... Lord, may we be known not for what we don't do, but may we be known for what we are doing. May we be known for what we are pursuing. May we be known as a church, as a family that loves to serve those around us. And Father, may each of us examine our hearts and say, am I doing my part? Am I carrying my weight? Father, we just ask and pray, Lord, that today would be the first step to say, I'm ready, I'm willing. Father, for those that don't know Christ, that is the place to begin. We can't be like Christ in service until we know Christ as our Savior. Father, may today they understand that He is the one who died for them and rose again. Father, for others that maybe it's simply saying, this is my church home, I, I want to join this church. I want to make this my family. I want to put my, my stake in this place. Father, we pray that we might be willing and obedient servants of Yours this day. Thank You again, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.